Hey everybody, what is up? Welcome back. This video is all about interest rates. And if that doesn't have you just jumping up and down with excitement, well, I don't know what will. Don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe while the music plays. All right, hopefully you've been able to compose yourself because now it is time to dive deep into interest rates. There's actually not a ton of content in this video, and in fact, I kind of already covered some of this topic in like a two sentence explanation in video 2.6. So I'm gonna say a couple of things here. The first type of interest rate that we're talking about is a nominal interest rate. And we've used that word nominal a lot in this class, but I just wanna point out that the word nominal can be defined as existing in name only. The reason I point this out is because nominal interest rates don't really matter on a meaningful level. Just like nominal GDP doesn't really matter or nominal wages or nominal income aren't very useful measurements, nominal interest rates are in the same boat. The reason we talk about them is that they're what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. As I'm making this video, the nominal interest rate for a new home is about 6.5%. It's about 3 to 8% for new cars, 4% for undergrad student loans, and so on. These are all nominal numbers. A nominal interest rate is the interest rate on a loan unadjusted for inflation. Because it doesn't account for inflation, it's missing a really important part of the story. A good question at this point would be to ask about how nominal interest rates are established. And I tell you that's a great question and we're gonna go really deeply into that in a future video in this unit. But since we haven't learned about that model yet, all I can really say is that nominal interest rates are determined by supply and demand. Both borrowers and lenders have certain expectations about what they think inflation will be like over the life of the loan and are therefore concerned about the real interest rate that they'll be either paying or receiving. The real interest rate is calculated by accounting for inflation. But see, that's the tricky part. Nobody knows what inflation will be in the future. If you did, then you'd be sitting on a pile of breaking bad money. This means that expectations about future inflation are gonna determine the nominal interest rate. Basically, it goes like this. The expected real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate minus the expected inflation rate. In this example, if the expected inflation rate is 4% and the nominal interest rate is 5%, it gives us an expected real interest rate of 1%. Now, suppose that both the borrowers and lenders expect inflation to be 14% instead of 4%. What would happen to the expected real interest rate? Well, the main thing is what happens to the nominal interest rate. If it stayed at 5%, the expected real interest rate would plunge to negative 9%. But is this realistic? Not really. Borrowers would obviously love to borrow money at a negative real interest rate, but lenders wouldn't be down for that. What would happen is that assuming nothing else changes, the real interest rate would stay at 1% because that's what borrowers and lenders actually care about. Now, for that to happen, it would require the nominal interest rate to rise to 15%, which sounds like a really high interest rate. But if everybody's expecting 14% inflation, we're still at the same 1% real interest rate as before. So in real terms, nothing has changed. The actual real interest rate can only be calculated after the fact once the inflation rate is known. We calculate it the same way. The actual real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate minus the actual inflation rate. From earlier in the course, you might remember that we made a big deal about expected and unexpected inflation. Remember we said that higher than expected inflation benefits borrowers? And one reason for that is because it reduces the actual real interest rate. By the way, we can class the section up by using some Latin here and saying ex ante for expected and ex post for actual. In college econ books, you'll probably see these equations expressed that way, so now you know. All right, this topic has been thoroughly covered, so until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell, and check out the description for a link to the answers to the practice questions on the screen, as well as the unit notes and a great review book I've written for you, Macro in 250 Words, and I will see you in the next video.